I'm Koyo Kuo, and uh, it's wonderful to see that this forum is so successful. It's amazing. Uh, it's, every session is, uh, is totally full. Um, I'm very happy, actually, for particularly for this session, because uh, when I was uh, conceptualizing and putting together the ideas for the forum this year, after our first edition last year, at some point I felt like there is a discussion that, that hasn't been discussed. <laughs> and uh, there is a conversation that, have, that hasn't started yet, and which I think needs some kind of uh, attention. And, uh, and initially, uh, my idea was to bring a generation of, uh, of artists, of uh, contemporary African artists, who have participated in the, what I call the establishment of a certain canon in the early 90s. Not only the generation of, uh, of, uh, of artists, but also, uh, as you know, artistic practice does not exist kind of alone. There is the whole microcosm or ecosystem around it that is made of curators, that is made of uh, magazines, that is made of exhibitions, galleries, and so on. So for those of you who have been maybe in the session before, uh, you should, would have heard how uh, someone like uh, uh, Elizabeth from Oto October Gallery traced the chronology of the rise and in interest in contemporary uh, African artistic practice. So, and we continue here with uh, three key protagonists, in my view, in my point of view, of uh, people who have uh, clearly defined and established uh, um, the context of uh, contemporary African art. I will begin with uh, introducing uh, Sokari Douglas Camp, which I think for the London audience doesn't need to be introduced anymore. But uh, Sokari is widely heralded as the most prolific contemporary African female artist, sculptor. Despite exploring vast subjects of criticality such as Africa's social political turmoil and the advance of globalization, she remains intimately connected to the ancestral origins of Buguma heritage. Is that correct? <laughs> and uh, she has uh, received international recognition for her large scale sculptures rendered in steel, which has led to the acquisition of her work by various public collections. In 2003, she was one of the six artists to be shortlisted for the fourth Plinth Commission in Trafalgar Square in London. Uh, in 2005, she was awarded the CBE. I never know exactly, I had to be educated about the CBE, OBE, MBE, because, uh, and this is really my, my lack of uh, knowledge of British culture. Be uh, at some point, at, uh, a few years ago, Yinka st uh, started writing his name, Yinka Shoninbare, MBE. And I was like, what the hell does that mean? That is so, CBE is, Commander, right? Yeah. Okay. Commander of the British Empire. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Carrie was awarded the CBE in recognition of her contribution to the arts. Please welcome So Carrie to the panel. <laughs> I will move on in. Uh, introducing uh, someone who almost didn't make it here. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, Abdullah is here this, uh, this morning. He arrived straight from Bamako early this morning after we spent three long weeks of battling with the UK Foreign Service to get a visa. And we managed, luckily. And uh, 
Abdullah is an artist who lives and works in, uh, in Bamako. He's well known for his installations, which offer a powerful commentary on political and environmental affairs. His work questions social and economic scenes in contemporary Mali, but also generally in the world. He has received several awards and has been exhibited internationally. And um, when paint and canvas were unavailable to him, that's what uh, he told us, he started uh, working on textile. And uh, I think I don't have to be very expansive on, uh, on Abdullah's work. You can admire it here for those of you who don't know it. It's, uh, it's uh, upstairs at uh, Primo Marella in the East Wing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, please welcome Abdullah. The discussion will be led and hosted by a notorious usual suspect <laughs> who is beyond being that has, I mean, I don't know anymore how to introduce Simon. So let's cut it short. <laughs> no, I still have to say something and why you are here because uh, people have to understand why you are everywhere. And, and especially here today because uh, I couldn't have this panel and without having someone who has been so instrumental in, in putting contemporary, art, uh, contemporary African art on the map. And uh, so instrumental not only through the magazine that he co-founded uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, Revue Noir, which has done, which, I mean, for me, for, for personally, I, I started being interested in contemporary Afri African art through Revue Noir. And by, I was, I was eager every three months to get the next issue. And all my education about contemporary African artistic practice was through that magazine first. So I think it's, a, it's an amazing achievement. We don't say it enough. The magazine doesn't exist anymore. But uh, for people who were aware of, uh, of this practice in the, in the 90s, uh, everybody knows how important Revue Re Noir was for us. So. Um, and this is also why Simon is here. I will not introduce further. Simon is a writer and critic and a prolific curator internationally and, uh, and a fierce advocate and supporter of contemporary African art. Uh, and Simon will be hosting this discussion. Thank you very much for welcoming Simon. <laughs> And I also welcome Paula, our wonderful VIP relation manager and occasional translator for Abdullah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you, Koyo, for those uh, introduction and for uh, having cooked this uh, panel discussion or this panel discussion. Uh, I'm usually bored by affairs and uh, it was good. I think that this is one of the reasons why I came first last year. is because the fair is interesting, money is interesting, but uh, ideas and discussions are what could make something valuable or not. So this fair is a so-called African art fair. Uh, Koyo said that I was an advocate of African art practices. I should correct her. I'm not advocating anything, uh, but, uh, but myself and a couple of friends are kind of a family. And the problem with that family is probably what, since Koyo mentioned it, is probably what led me to, uh, to do whatever I was doing, is that that family have been talked about for too long a time. Uh, I remember times where uh, those I called a specialist of speciality would try to tell me about Cameroon, where I'm coming from, because they made their PhD on some uh, people in Cameroon that I even didn't know. 
and they were teaching that somewhere, and uh, they thought that they were the authority to, to talk about those people. And um, what people need to know is probably that the only authority possible is, uh, is an education, is a fact, is a fate. And uh, the, the first question, because I still wonder, uh, I was very slow at school and a lot of concept I couldn't understand, so I'm still learning. So the first question I would like to ask to, to Abdullahi and to Sokari, starting by Sokari, lady first, is uh, what is Africa for you? Gosh. Um, I, I, I really didn't know what to say, Simon. What is it for you? Uh, what is it for me? Uh, it's uh, it's uh, the Bassa land, where my family is coming from. Bassa people are part of uh, the construction that was made, and that is called Cameroon. And, uh, and I like to be a Bassa because I don't like to be a shrimp, because uh, Cameroon is taking its name from a Portuguese discoverer who, discovering that there were a lot of shrimps in the Bay of Douala, called the country Camarões, which means shrimps in Portuguese. So Cameroon is coming from there. So I'd rather be a Bassa than, uh, than a Cameroonian or Cameroonese. And, uh, and for me, Africa starts there. And that's why uh, there's somebody who wrote something about uh, the, the quest of Africa or the invention of Africa. I think that Africa is something that needs to be invented every day and that the best person to invent it are the person who are reinventing themselves because uh, there's no, as I said centuries ago, there's no such a thing as a homo africanus so there's no essentiality. Koyo was mentioning that uh, the other day and this morning. Uh, so, well, I, I'm, I'm outside anyway of whatever definition uh, people would try to get because uh, if you don't speak Bassa already, the African you might be referring to uh, would not concern me. So uh, my, uh, my Africa is just a kind of a permanent deconstruction of preconceptions. Wow. <laughs> well, um, my Africa is Calabari, I guess. Um, but, you know, I, I come from Nigeria um, and um, we're 54 years old this year and we're beginning to see ourselves as Nigerians, which is quite thrilling, really. Um, and um, when they place us in the continent of Africa. Um, I must confess, I'm always surprised just because it's a huge continent and I don't understand how people can talk about it so easily because um, my background is that um, as a Calabari person, 25 miles away, people spoke a different language and were culturally different and almost visually different. So when they talk about the continent, it's like talking about the world for me. So uh, that, that's my view of Africa. So, Monsieur Konate, pour vous, l'Afrique, c'est quoi? Bon, euh, bon, bonsoir tout le monde. Euh, L'Afrique, je ne sais pas si c'est si c'est un nom donné par les géographes, par les historiens, par les ethnographes, comme ils ont donné pour l'Europe, pour l'Asie, euh, je pense que c'est un regroupement de diversité qui se sont trouvés par hasard de, de, de la nature dans un espace donné, mais je pense qu'ils qu restent très ouverts comme le reste des, des, des autres continents. Euh, il y a certainement... Si, si tu ne fais pas, pas quelques pauses, euh, oui, pour l'avoir oui. bon. du mal. Oui, je lui dis bonsoir, il dit qu'il ne sait pas... Euh, sorry. <rire> <rire> ça commence bien. These are the best translations. <rire> 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 translation French to French. 
sorry. He, does, he said he, do, he does not know. I don't know where the word Africa came from. It might be a word that was given to Africa like any other place such as Europe or the Americas. But uh, it might just be a regroupment of uh, different spaces that are very diverse and that is very uh, open. Certainly, with, as you said, with a lot of diversity, but there are also certain unities cultural qui permet d'avoir un fil rouge et qui fait une cohésion sociale. Mm -hmm. but, um, I think that it also has a, um, co uh, a cohesion of culture and also a thread that goes throughout the continent. And, and that, that, that thread is, is constructed by, by those uh, social groups that allows it to to function throughout Africa, that Africa is nothing as such, but it's made by those groups that are creating the cohesion. C'est peut-être ce fil rouge qui permet de, de définir certains continents sur le plan essentiellement culturel, parce que le problème c'est essentiellement ça. So it is this thread that might be able to uh, explain the unity of uh, the different countries in Africa. Parce que sur le plan des ressources. On ne détermine plus les continents. Les mines n'ont pas de continents. Par contre, c'est beaucoup plus le côté culturel où on essaie de bloquer des grands espaces. So it says, I cannot talk in terms of resources because obviously mines do not have continents, but uh, it can be defined throughout Africa can be defined throughout cultures instead of resources. C'est peut-être une définition terre à terre, mais C'est ce que ça me rappelle un peu, quoi. L'Afrique est une terre. It might be a basic definition, but that's how we define Africa. Uh, then, now, I guess uh, the, the curator of this talk, which is a smart young girl, even if she's not so young anymore, but she's still very, <laughs> she's still very young and very <laughs> kicking to me. Uh, uh, and I guess that uh, the, the fact that Abdullah and, uh, and Sir Kerry are here is very interesting when we talk about essentiality and when we talk about uh, uh, kind of a, something that would be or that somebody could call Africa or an African. Uh, Sir Kerry is a Londoner, uh, Abdullah is a Cuban, <laughs> but both in a certain way are revisiting traditions, are revisiting things, not reproducing them, but, but bringing them to another level, using this material as a source of inspiration that become universal. It's like when Sir Kari is doing her craft or where Abdullah is doing his, uh, they're not focusing on uh, am I African or not, like these guys, it to be or not to be African, that is the question. They're just doing what they're doing, and the material they're using is, uh, is a material that is coming precisely from those uh, societies or micro society uh, that, are, that are making Africa and that one cannot uh, describe if one hasn't been there. So, so Carrie, uh, what I like about you is the fact that you speak English, like a, a, a Londoner. And uh, at the same time, you've been dealing a lot with uh, the Calabari, the, the festival, all those things that were coming from your, your childhood. Could you elaborate on, on the fact that these were the major sources of, of your inspiration? Uh. Yes, I, I, I can elaborate. Um, would I be able to share my um, film? Because um, I think the film talks more about my work than I can. I see. <coughs> Just ask. OK, this is... Um, this film is going to be... Sh oh, he's... Yeah. I'd like to play you this film. Um, it does have audio as well. It's very high-pitched and from a different era, but this is um, Calabari dancing. And it's about a priestess. Is it, is it possible to dim the lights for the screening time? Okay. 
Different era. Who is that young girl? <laughs> That's my heritage, um, Calabari heritage, um, studying masqueraders and um, traditional performers and um, trying to find a path for myself in, in the, my profession as an artist. Yeah. Uh, Abdullahi, have it, you have a take on that? Euh, le, le tout début de, du choc que j'ai eu par rapport euh, à la formation à l'école, c'est que j'ai eu la chance d'étudier les cultures des autres continents, des autres pays. Et à l'université, je n'étais pas là. Ma culture n'était pas là. Et... J'ai eu ma culture là-bas par des artistes européens qui ont travaillé sur ça. Mais euh, en tant qu'artiste, je n'avais pas de documentation réelle. J'avais une documentation visuelle, plastique, mais sur le fond euh, culturel, euh, de tradition orale, de tradition familiale, on était très très loin de ce que on avait à l'école. So my first shock when I was um, uh, being educated was that I had the chance to be exposed to different cultures. But when I went to un university, I had the chance to uh, to find out about Europeans that were working on my culture, but there was no presence of uh, African tradition, such as oral tradition, no documentation about my own culture. Et j'ai pu noter aussi que tous les continents ont développé leur art avec uh, leur matériel environnant. And I noticed also that other culture, cultures had the chance to uh, explore uh, art through their, uh, through uh, materials or uh, subjects that were around them in their own environment. Donc pour moi, tout type de matériel peut servir pour s'exprimer. Therefore, for me, all sorts of materials 
through them, you can express yourself through them, particularly if they are in your environment. Et dans mes expressions, ce que je trouve qui est commun, quel que soit le continent, c'est beaucoup plus le problème de, de souffrance humaine ou de plaisir humain. On se rend compte que ça n'a pas de frontières. Exactly. And I think that the common... Exactly. Non, non, non. <laughs> <laughs> the common denominator for all sorts of inspiration is human suffering and also uh, human exhilaration. He said, so that's he said pleasure. Pleasure, pleasure, exhilaration, pleasure. And that's why you said yes, I hope <laughs> uh, Well, uh, Abdullah, you, you're pointing out something uh, interesting, is the, the absence, or what we could call the non-presence. Um, and I would like to address that in, in both terms. It's like, on the one hand, there was the non-presence outside, and on the other hand, there was the the absence of references. So, you, you, you're a very young, upcoming artist, but uh, you've been there in the, the early 90s. Uh, how was the environment? I mean, nowadays, I'm talking for the kids who are seeing fairs, and there wouldn't be a, a Venice Biennale or a documentary without a, an African, an Asian, etc. But back to the days, how, how was it to be... Uh, what they called an African artist? Um, well, funnily enough, I, I wasn't an African artist then, in the 90s. Um, yeah, uh, I wasn't an African artist then. I was an artist. Um, and um, it was quite strange because it was um, museums that were interested in my work. Um, rather than um, regular galleries. And that was because of the mood of the time, which was um, magicians uh, of Africa. Uh, of Earth. Of Earth. The, the Magicians of Earth exhibition that happened, when was it? 88? 89. 89. Um, and, um, and then sort of museums got even more excited about animating their collection of African art. Um, but before then, when this film was made, um, um, I was considered just an artist and um, happened to talk about my Calabari heritage um, uh, because I'd been told by a, a very uh, wonderful teacher on my BA course that if I wasn't inspired by things in Holborn, that was fine. I could um, be excited by things in my hometown. So you, you remind me of this guy, I don't know what he, he became. It was somebody who, who was painting in the, in the 90s and uh, his English was probably not very good because uh, he was signing his painting A double S. And uh, when I first met him, I asked him if he knew what he, that meant in, uh, in English. And then he was telling me that story that he, he studied at uh, the, the art school of Paris, Les Beaux-Arts, and that he had a problem integrating the, whatever the teacher uh, were, were telling him. And then he, he had a click when he went back home for some holidays. He said, oh, I'm not Greek. They're trying to teach me some Greek canons, but when I go, go back home, I see that the canons are different. And that was the click for him to uh, kind of uh, question uh, the, the existing model. Uh, Abdullah, what was the click for you? Back to the days. Oh, why Paola is translating. Oh, I apologize for translating. You have to remember that in those years, early 90s, uh, when uh, an African was using video photograph, some curators would say, he's not African, because this is not African enough. It's not magician enough, probably. So, Abdoulaye? Um, um, well, uh En réalité, pour moi, je n'ai jamais eu de, de choc, de contrainte. Uh, I never had any, uh, limitations. Même mentalement, je ne considère pas la réaction euh, 
que ce soit de, de, de spectateur ou de, en, en essayant de cataloguer quelqu'un, je pense que c'est juste une méconnaissance de, de, de l'autre, quoi. I do not uh, take into account the way people profile artists. I just think it's probably a lack of knowledge. Parce que ce qui est sûr... He's talking about himself. He didn't say artist, he said me. Okay. It's important. Parce que ce qui est sûr, euh, quelle que soit la partie du monde, on se rend compte que chaque que civilisation a développé une forte culture. You, you realize that, I realize that wherever you go in the world, each civilization has um, created its own very strong culture. Et plus on méconnaît l'autre, on, on a l'impression de, de, de classifier euh, en disant que sa culture est supérieure à l'autre. And less you know of another culture, the easier it is uh, to uh, to catalogue them and uh, to see them as an inferior culture. Indépendamment du visuel, mais quand, même quand tu commences à discuter avec quelqu'un, tu te rends compte de ce, de ce qu'il a comme base culturelle en famille, quel que soit le pays. Wherever you go, it's, it is even more obvious, apart from maybe uh, from a visual appreciation, when you, when you have the chance to interact with uh, people, you realize that It is a lack of uh, knowledge that instructs the Donc je pense, des, c voilà, je pense que c'est des, des rapports qui vont évoluer petit à petit. And I do think these are, uh, this is a relationship that will evolve with time between Ça peut prendre du temps, mais forcément, ça va, ça va changer. It might take time, but, with, um, but it will change. No, it, it leads me uh, to... Uh... I hate post-colonial theories, so what I'm going to say should not be classified as post-colonial or anti-colonial. It's just philosophy, uh, uh, an attempt. Um, uh, I have the feeling, and you shall correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, you, you worked, not necessarily that it was your goal, but you work as teachers for those people who had a kind of an essentialist idea of what you people were as individual. For instance, you were saying when you were working, you were not working as an African artist, you were working as, a, as an artist. And some people came to tell you that you were an African artist. And what Abdullahi was saying is that uh, the lack of knowledge creates misunderstandings. And this is where Hegel comes. Uh, Hegel wrote this paradox of the master and the slave. And uh, when it comes to contemporaneity, I have the feeling, and I would like you to react on that, that there's no better place for contemporaneity than Africa and maybe the Caribbean or Latin America, mm -hmm. simply because uh, we, if we reverse this uh, master and slave paradox, uh, the story is simple. Uh, Hegel was saying, it's much longer, but Hegel was saying, mm -hmm. a slave doesn't need a master to be a slave. A master without a slave is not a master, so he's the strongest. Master. Just think um, about Robinson Crusoe. He found himself a member of the British Empire only when Vendredi arrived. So who gave them the power to be what he, he longed to be? And uh, during those years, they were, uh, on a personal note, I had friends, we were dealing with art, etc., etc., and probably Revenoir came from, from that uh, consciousness. Your artists were doing I was looking and commenting, and I'm discussing with uh, some friends, and one of them is telling me, you know, what is terrible is that there's nothing contemporary coming from Africa. You know, the Africans. And I just realized that despite my very chocolate skin, this person was talking to me as if I was not an African, and as if we were dealing with the others. So I think that in that sense, you work you by saying you didn't pay attention, you by saying in other terms you didn't pay attention, contributed to educate uh, the international art, uh, art scene. Uh, were you conscious to educate them by, by your attitude, both of you? Um, yeah, I think I was. Yeah. 
because you you had to sort of um, you had to sort of say things from your point of view, uh, from your experience. So um, at, at the time, um, Central, which is now Central St Martins, did encourage you to kind of um, explain where you were coming from. So I was quite happy to do that, and um, I, I I was encouraged to educate people, I guess, um, with the things that I found aesthetically stimulating and um, exciting, yeah. Oui, euh, peut-être je, je vais juste... Euh, c'est un, un petit souvenir qui me reste souvent. Euh, quand je dis petit, peut-être c'est trop... c'est exagéré. Euh, J'ai eu la chance de connaître lui, Fredo Lam, quand j'étais étudiant. Wilfredo, Wilfredo Lam. Et en ce moment, il venait de temps en temps à Cuba. Et nous, tous les week-ends, il était à l'hôpital. On lui amenait tous les travaux qu'on faisait à l'école. Je sais que vous êtes tous très éduqués, très international et très global. Mais pour les few qui ne savent pas qui Wilfredo Lam est ou a c'est le plus grand peintre historique de Cuba. Et quand les le week-ends, je partais lui montrer mes, mes, mes croquis, mes dessins, euh, un jour il m'a dit « Qu'est-ce que vous venez faire à Cuba si vous avez tout chez vous ?» Donc, quand j'ai eu la chance de rencontrer ce très bien connu cubain painter, j'étais en Cuba et j'ai eu l'hôpital chaque hospital every weekend pour lui montrer ce que j'ai fait, mes croquis, et il m'a dit « me. Why are you coming here to show me what you've done in Cuba if you have everything you need at home? C'est vrai que eux se sont beaucoup inspirés de de cette de la culture de ces parties du 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 monde de de l'Afrique. Mais c'est vraiment une question qui m'a beaucoup perturbé et je cherchais un jour je je lui ai dit peut-être le concept qui me permet d'analyser ma culture, c'est peut-être c'est ce que je viens chercher. En Cuba, ils étaient vraiment inspirés par l'Afrique culture. Et peut-être pour moi, en une façon, pour savoir sur ma culture, j'ai dû aller et regarder ça par une autre culture's um, perspective ou insight. Peut-être qu'on ne nous donne pas cette formation comme telle à l'école, mais ça nous permet de. De, de, faire, de faire un rebond sur euh, de là où on vient. Um, maybe we don't have the chance uh, to experience uh, Africa in uh, in Africa, African culture in Africa, but it gives us a chance to go away and think about it and come back. Yes, and uh, why well, he said it's uh, through education, not mm. necessarily in Africa. I mean. Uh, a lot of people who didn't study in Africa mm -hmm. didn't find a lot in their classes about Africa. But that was for, for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And after Cuba, it's still the question for me how this generation who lives on the continent, entre parenthèses, poverty economically, comment ces, ces, ces jeunes peuvent contribuer euh, au même titre que les autres jeunes du monde sur le problème de l'humanité. Donc, j'ai essayé de concevoir euh, un programme de formation d'école d'art étant en Afrique. Et dans cette conception, J'ai pris trois trois grands axes peut-être un peu. Okay. So my reflection was how a new generation of young artists in a, in a continent that is very poor economically could contribute to the humanity of the world, and that is why I created a, a program to form them in an art school. Uh, no. he, he didn't create a program. He created in a school. school. Yes. No, mm. he created a school. Yeah. Donc, à l'école, three, three voilà. on a essayé de prendre euh, un axe qui est 
euh, ce qu'on donne dans les académies des beaux-arts où nous, nous avons eu à faire nos études. So the first um, act was to uh, create a school where they had the, the chance to experience what okay. we experienced in uh, the art schools in Europe. Qui est essentiellement basé sur la maîtrise technique de l'outil, euh, savoir dessiner, savoir euh, discuter, euh, voilà, savoir reproduire, quoi, avoir euh, la maîtrise technique. Yeah, which is mainly to, uh, to be able to master the art techniques. So that was the first angle of... Um... Voilà, à, à cela, j'ai voulu ajouter euh, notre tradition, notre fond culturel. And to that, I wanted to add our um, cultural um, background, background voilà, qui and est, our traditions. Voilà, qui n'est pas enseigné dans les écoles à l'extérieur. Which are not taught on, in the art schools outside et, of the continent. Et c'est quelque chose qu'on vit et avec la rupture de, de, du développement aujourd'hui, du développement technique, tech, la jeunesse africaine est en train de perdre aussi euh, ce fond culturel. And the, sorry, avec, le développement, avec le développement technologique aujourd'hui, on sent que euh, la tradition en Afrique est en train de se perdre aussi parce que le passage ne se fait pas. With the uh, um, technical advancements in Africa, oh, I the feel... The new technology basically are killing tradition for, for, for youth. But uh, Abdullah, you, you, you talk about education, and, and I want to go back from where those ideas came, and those ideas uh, became what, what is uh, guiding you now, the, the, the fact to transmit. The fact to transmit uh, means that you're conscious yourself of the different position and different games that are played uh, in the world. And uh, the fact also that in those games, uh, Africa has no voice. But I've seen something that was a transformation through the 90s. I remember back to the days, late 80s, there was a curator from the, the magician who was in Africa somewhere, we were together, and would ask questions to the artists he wanted to take on board. And then when the questionnaire is finished and when this curator would be satisfied, he would say, OK, I'm taking this, this and that. And in the mid-90s, you could see a change that was quite interesting that I witnessed. It's the same curator, let's say, not namely the same, coming to a studio visit and asking da da di da da da. And he says, well, OK, I'm taking this, this and that. And then the artist would say, we haven't done yet. Now you need to tell me your background. You need to tell me what you've been doing so that I can decide if I'm going to make a show with you or not. And I think that all this was, was formed by, uh, by, by those crucial years where uh, people who were trained without knowing that I was supposed to be this or that were confronted to, to, to the, the other gaze and had both to educate that gaze and also to go back to, to certain type of roots. Uh, and before I let you comment on that, remember my friend Watara, who was supposed to be here as well. Watara was studied at Boza in Paris, studied at Boza in uh, Abidjan before. And uh, he was doing whatever he was doing. I remember one day I'm visiting him in New York, and his voicemail was saying, Juju man, Juju man, ah ah. <laughs> so he took him all the way from Abidjan to New York to, to become quote unquote an African. What kind of African, an African he selected to be. Uh, which is very interesting with uh, those, uh, those 90s is, is the matter of gaze. Uh, one moves from being an object that is talked about to become a a thinking subject that is talking about himself and commenting on the world. Uh, did, did you have the feeling that this, this happened or did you feel it in your, in your work and the way you were um, negotiating your, your, your work, not only in the silence of the studio, but when confronted to, to the outside? Yeah. <laughs> 
colleagues. Have you lost me? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um, do, do you want to answer that first? No, no, first. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. I, well, I'm. I'm. St I th think. Um, yes. Kind of uh, working with festivals and things was fairly easy. Um, and explaining my reaction to festivals, first of all, was quite easy. Um, but then, you know, I think as the 90s went on, um, it, it became noisy, is the only way I can describe it. So noisy that um, one wasn't able to land, as they say in Nigeria. You weren't allowed to say your piece because so many people had something to say about what um, they were seeing or you were doing. Um, so I, I gave some lectures saying, let me land, <laughs> let me talk. Character nice. It's true that the work of individual artists has a lot played. Euh, dans, dans le changement de, de, de mentalité des, des commissaires vis-à-vis -vis du travail. Mais je pense aussi l'apparition des revues, euh, les, les, les revues qui, sont, qui ont commencé à donner des images, même s'il n'y a pas de, de texte. Mais au fur et à mesure que les revues sortaient les, les, les créations, ça a beaucoup changé la mentalité je pense, et des galeries, des commissaires, mais aussi des marchands aussi. Of course, the work of art of the arts has changed uh, the, the way curators and galleries looked at their work. But very impo the most important was um, the reviews, the art reviews, that um, even when there was no text, even just the fact that they, they were published in art reviews really changed uh, the way the work uh, was looked at. Et, et la constance de travail des artistes a, a fait aussi bouger les choses, quoi. And also the, the, the constant work. The constant work of the artists also um, changed the landscape for them. Well, I was not sure I would do that, but I'll do that as shortly as possible. Uh, to go back to the magazine, since you mentioned them, I remember that we, when we created Revue Noire, it was simply because we had the feeling that all the people who were traveling Africa or living in Europe were blind. When my friend would tell me there's no such a thing as contemporaneity in Africa, I said, are you blind? And we said, we're going to show it. And we have a very clear way of showing it, uh, contrary to the specialists in speciality. Uh, we decided to make propositions and to try to discover what we were discovering, quote, unquote, and quote, unquote, <laughs> instead of pretending that we knew. I mean, the little I know now, it's because I've been in almost all the countries in Africa and I've been learning. So it was, at the same time, a publicizing process and a learning process for us. And the, the second uh, thing, and I saw that this was working when people were not uh, totally stupid, because one of the many confusion of this thing that is called contemporary African art is that for a very long time, it was a realm of ethnographers. There was no art historian who was dealing with that. So if you ethnographed, of course, uh, somebody is not going to talk about your aesthetic, is going to talk about the utilitarity of your work instead of looking. So there was a generation of blind uh, curators and a generation of uneducated curators. And I remember the late uh, Jan Hoot. We were... That was yours? Uh, we were in Germany somewhere dealing with all these things. And Jan Hoot was then the director of the Castle Documenta. And we're sitting at the same panel. That time I was young and nasty. And uh, Hoot is saying that he toured Africa and he saw nothing. So we had an argument that was kind of, uh, I was just trying to kill him. It was not even a philosophical discussion or whatever. <laughs> But then I happened to have with me the first issue of Revue Noir magazine. 
And I said, if you know nothing, I can help. But three months later, I received a call asking for two names that were in the magazine, and I was showed in Jan Hood's documenta, which proves that at least Jan was not completely stubborn and that he could uh, admit what he, he was not seeing. We should do something for that telephone. Now, it's very much here, <laughs> somewhere. So you, you, you're talking about magazines. Uh, what, what, what was your relationship with, to magazines at that time? Uh, what was, uh, were the magazine writing about your work? Or was there only, you said that earlier, the, the museum or certain type of institution? No, you, you came along. <laughs> You came along. Um, yeah, I, I was in the second edition of the Revue Noir. Um, and um, yes, so you were a different audience um, for me from ethnographic um, <coughs> museum audiences. Um, and yes, I mean, you know, I'm a person who's even shown in the um, <coughs> Natural History Museum <laughs> in New York. But I, I think um, it's also important to say that um, it's important to be seen <laughs> as an artist, otherwise you, you simply won't have a career. You know, so whether you're an ethnographic museum or you know, a, a regular gallery, I think um, m most artists can understand being a tart, quite frankly. You just have to get out there and go to as many places as possible so that you can have a broader conversation, so, um, but um, I, I didn't really get reviews in sort of art, art forum or anything like that. Um, but Review Noir came along and encouraged um, a more of a um, yeah gallery conversation about my work, which was encouraging. I'm <coughs> C'est vrai que les revues sont, sont importantes. Euh, on avait très peu de chance hein, d'être dans, dans des revues. Et moi, personnellement, quand j'ai des œuvres dans les revues, j'ai peur de, de regarder. Je regarde beaucoup plus euh, les œuvres des autres, les, les autres revues. Mais quand je suis là-dedans, euh, très rarement, je, je, je regarde. Ou quand je vois, je ferme. Quoi. Je ne sais pas. C'est... Uh, I had little opportunity to, uh, to see, uh, to have access to uh, magazines, but even when I did, I was more interested in looking at others' um, work of art than mine, and every time I saw mine, I just closed the magazine. <laughs> because uh, because he, he feared what would be written on, on his work, so he, he could deal with other people's works, but not not with his. Uh, now, before we, 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 we try to, to have a conversation with the, the audience. Pardon, je voulais juste yeah. ajouter quelque chose là, par rapport à, à l'état d'être vu dans, dans les espaces. C'est vrai qu'au euh, début euh, euh, de nos productions, euh, tout le monde regardait nos créations comme euh, des objets ethnographiques ethnologique, je ne sais pas. Mais moi, ça ne me gênait pas parce que euh, j'ai toujours pensé dans, 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 dans cette idée de, 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 no de notre culture. On dit, tu peux mettre l'or dans l'ordure, ça ne change pas sa nature. Quelqu'un qui le connaît va le prendre. Donc je me suis dit, quel que soit le lieu où on va te mettre un jour, Si ce n'est pas ta place, ils vont te prendre et te mettre dans une autre place. C'est seulement un problème d'éducation, de patience, d'attente, que ce soit devant toi ou après ta mort, ça n'a pas d'importance. Mais euh, l'essentiel, c'est de travailler et d'être très conscient de ce que tu fais. Paola Oui. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, at the beginning, um, our work was shown as a in uh, ethnographic uh, museums. And uh, for me, it was okay. It was, it's not something I was uncomfortable with because I always say there's a saying that says that you can uh, put the gold in the bin, 
but it's a quite it's, uh, somebody will always recognize it. Uh, always to, to, to pit gold in, in a dustbin doesn't change the nature of gold. Exactly. Uh, so what Abdullah was saying that it was just a matter of time and not being constant and on work, work, and work. And there will be a moment, maybe during his lifetime or after, uh, his, his preoccupation was always just to be constant with himself, true to himself, which is exactly what uh, what Sokari was, was saying earlier, is that what was important was to be seen, to be shown, and with education and with awareness, people would probably change. And this is what happened. Uh, on that note, maybe we could start the conversation with, with the audience. If you have questions, you raise them now or you shut up forever. Mm -hmm. oh, this is what I was told is said in weddings. Hi, it's working. Hello, everyone. I have a couple of questions and I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to go through all of these seven questions that I wrote. Yeah, I, might, try, try I, I might, I might, just take, I might just take some time to, for each of you later cool. after this discussion. So I would just um, underline two of those. The first one, it's linked to what Koya, Koya, what you were saying at the beginning of, I mean, in your introduction, and that was somehow then uh, re, uh, re, retraced uh, by you, Simon, and it's linked to the fact. Uh, that Cameroon, and this is a question that I mean, it's, it's an important question to, to address, that Cameroon, uh, before the establishment of the so-called United Nations, that at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, I don't know exactly the date, it should be between the 20s and 30s, uh, signed in the States uh, a pact which they ta have taken, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I have not studied this subject, unfortunately, I'm coming from a completely different educational background. No matter, but try the, try uh, the camera, that, yeah, that Cameroon de facto was then uh, divided in the French and in the uh, yeah, British, between, between the British, the British uh, yes. land. I wanted to understand how was this, I mean, how would you link this to, to the bus setting? And how, how, how do you see Africa also in, I mean, your identity, in your, your, um, your conception of African art and the whole history of African art of the 20th century in relation to this specific historical fact? That's one question. And then and maybe then, later then, another one. No, but Thank then you. we will we, we'll like to, the mic circulate I'm for sorry other Sorry if things. I've been taking a bit of uh, Well, I mean, the... The, the divide of, uh, of Cameroon into two countries does not concern me because the Basa people didn't have that kind of Berlin Wall in between them. They were speaking Basa, so English or French was not their problem. Yes. I'd like to address the questions to the artist Abdullah uh, Hassal Sabah from Kuwait. Um, I would like to know what made him go to Cuba and what was the effect of the Cuban art on him and what did he actually come back with from Cuba? If you heard him while he's being translated, he said he came back from Cuba with Africa. But we'll let him translate, uh, answer. Non, euh, mon départ à Cuba est, est, est vraiment un hasard, c'est un accord entre le gouvernement cubain et le gouvernement malien. Donc Cuba offrait des bourses aux étudiants. So it was by chance that I went uh, to Cuba. There was a, a, an, agreement. an agreement between those governments which allowed him to have... Um, sorry, I'm losing my words now. Uh, to uh, have a grant. Yeah, some, some scholarships. Yeah. Uh, but 
back to those days. Abdullah is still a very young man, of course. Uh, but uh, the non-aligned, etc., etc., the colonization, uh, most of the African countries uh, would have done anything with China, with Russia, that was USSR at that time, with Cuba, then with the former uh, colonial nations. So you had a lot of things like that, Algerians going to Moscow, some people going to study here and there. So. Mais la, la même année, il y avait aussi euh, des bourses pour le Brésil, mais euh, la bourse de Cuba était venue plus en avance, quoi. Donc nous, on a été sciences tenantes. Well, in the same, at the same time, there were grants also to go to Brazil, but uh, the grants from Cuba came first, so they took that chance. Il y a certains qui sont partis euh, en Union soviétique. Comment tu dis USSR? And so on and so forth. Et voilà, mais ce que j'ai retenu de, de, de de ma période à Cuba, c'est beaucoup plus euh, euh, ces études euh, académiques très poussées. Et c'est aussi ce que tu as dit, Vifredo Lam. Oui, et c'est aussi parce que j'ai trouvé à Cuba, à cette période, un, un, un grand combat entre des générations. Il y avait la vieille génération. Euh, Qui, qui a vu des artisans, qui a vu l'époque de, de Batista et qui venait, euh, qui était là, et la nouvelle génération, qui était euh, celle qui a été formée par euh, le, le régime socialiste. La révolution. La, la révolution. Mais dans ce concept, il se trouve aussi que j'ai compris que Cuba ne posait pas forcément ce qu'on appelait la révolution culturelle socialiste. Parce qu'ils étaient là, euh, tiraillés entre euh, leur passé, un peu espagnol, un peu américain, un peu africain, euh, mais en tout cas un passé totalement différent de ce qui se passait dans, dans le régime socialiste euh, de l'Union soviétique, qui était euh, un, un appui très fort pour, pour Cuba. Donc moi, ça m'a permis de d'avoir un recul par rapport à, à une zone culturelle euh, qui est en train de, de se transformer et qui est en train de transformer une jeunesse euh, entre euh, voilà dans un combat politique quoi. So what I um, I uh, took away with me from Cuba is uh, the struggles, the generational struggles that was taking place at the time between an old uh, generation that were under Batista and a new generation that was um, part of the, revolution, the socialist revolution movement. And I also understood that um, there was no cultural revolution because this new generation was tiered between those very different um, cultures they were going through, which is the American culture, the Spanish culture, so they, um, so um, it gave me um, a chance to have some insight into the transformation that was taking place, but which was not so clear. That's what we can say, but maybe each person has an acquisition of a day in a continent or in a country, a lot more profound, but these are elements that can come out rapidly. Oui, mais cela dit, je pense, he said, well, maybe some people have some deeper, had some deeper experience than the one I had. And I was about to tell him that uh, the encounter with Vifredo Lam was, I think, important enough. When you're in Cuba and the greatest painter there who was friend with Picasso and all those people from the Paris school, you're there, you see, maestro, what do you think? And this guy tells you, well, you have everything in Africa. Why, why are you coming here? There's nothing for you to find here. So I think that that was a, a kind of a, an important enough uh, experience there. Yeah, oui, ça c'est très important. Il y avait aussi d'autres professeurs. À mes débuts, je leur montrais le travail. On pouvait faire quatre mois, cinq mois. Ils me disent pas. Ils font pas de critique du tout. Ils ne, ils ne te disent rien. Ils, ils observent et puis euh, des fois tu as du mal comment te lever pour partir. 
No, yeah. and, uh, there, there was also another experience, and we move to uh, another question, is that uh, when he was studying in Cuba, some, uh, his professor would look at his work and would be silent about it for three, four, five months. And himself was that he used trying to translate it literally, he said, and every morning you would wonder how to, to, to wake up and to walk because those guys were so silent and they were just leaving you with yourself for month and month and you didn't know what they were thinking uh, about your work. After two years, he commence to talk to you. And after, there are links of friendship, three years, four years after, they tell you, but on ne savait même pas comment commencer pour te critiquer. And they say, and then they would start two years after. They saw his first work. And then four years after, they would start to address the work and tell him, we didn't know, we didn't know how to, to start our critique. We, we didn't know where, where to start. Parce que leur silence me, me posait and, beaucoup and de questions. And Dubai is a non-talkative person. Et ça me rappelait <laughs> ma maman. Pour te donner souvent des conseils sur des choses, elle te regarde, elle te dit rien. It means that he's very, he feels very good here. And he said that those teachers would, would remind him of his mother uh, in his childhood. He would be doing things, he would just stare at you like this, but say nothing. <laughs> so he had Donc voilà, some decades later, the same te, kind of... Voilà, qui te, qui te questionne et puis qui te remet en cause sans même dire un mot, quoi. So he had a kind of things or situation that forces you to rethink or to re-question yourself without any question being asked. Voilà, souvent, le silence pèse lourd. <laughs> and you say, at times, silence is heavy. <laughs> so, another question? I don't know, Koyo, the uh, last question. Hi, BC. I saw you coming. <laughs> The question is to the lady. Uh, so Carrie Douglas Kemp. We, we recently uh, were in, in Lagos and we discovered, uh, I discovered uh, Nigerian art. It seems to be, um, and you, you are one of the, the first ones, but it seems to be today very flourishing and there is a lot of artists in Nigeria. Are they all <coughs> exporting their art or mostly uh, working locally? Are they what? exporting their art. It's interesting to hear that term. I knew shrimps were exported, I didn't know that art was written. And the question was, are they exporting their art or are they just uh, selling in a local market? The, the new generation, the booming generation that he I, encountered I'd in Nigeria. I'd ask BC that question. She's a, a gallerist in Nigeria. I, I'm an artist here in London, so I'm not sure that I can really answer your question, but BC can. Okay, so that's a, a nice conclusion. No, BC <laughs> will do that in one by one. You'll have the privilege to have a one by one conversation with BC, who will tell you everything about that booming generation in Nigeria. So uh, I, I guess that the tradition is to thank 154 to, for hosting us, thank uh, Koyo Kuo for uh, cooking this, and, and Abdullah is not done yet. You <laughs> wanted just add. Je voulais juste ajouter euh, à sa question, pourquoi il ne s'étonne pas du nombre d'étudiants dans les universités Est-ce qu'ils auront à exporter leurs connaissances No, and, and Abdullah just wanted to make a point on this exportation of uh, young artists. Uh, and his question would have been, uh, he's not Cuban, he's not his mother yet, he'd like to, you know, uh, his question would be, why don't you ask yourself what happened with the millions of students? Are they able to export whatever the knowledge they, they have acquired? Parce que c est, c est, c est ah, le, 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 problème, le problème est général. Hein? <laughs> la, la, formation, la, formation acad... la formation artistique, je pense qu'elle est fondamentale au même titre que la formation en médecine, en, en sciences. Euh, C'est pas fait forcément pour être exporté. So On a besoin d'une nourriture euh, 
On a Spirit. besoin de l'ADN pour la culture. So this will be the last. Uh, uh, what we're saying is that he thinks that uh, art education is as important as uh, uh, medic studies or uh, engineering or whatever, because uh, we need that that food. We need that food, and it's very important. And uh, that food is not necessarily to be exported. It's just needed. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Merci, Abdoulaye. Thank you, Sir Thank you, Paola.